Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us to look at how education can shape the future. Today, we share ideas from UNESCO's new flagship report, Reimagining Our Future Together, a new social contract for education. Well, two years in the making uh, and informed by an extensive consultation process that involved over one million voices worldwide, the report articulates a new vision for education and the future. I think it's the right place and the right time to talk about the future. Throughout the conference, uh, we heard that we need to change dramatically, and we couldn't agree more at UNESCO. With each passing year, we see more clearly that human freedoms and human rights are at risk. We see that our relationships with our planet and its many life forms are dangerously out of balance. Unsustainable practices and injustice are becoming alarmingly commonplace. Well, this report is about reimagining and transforming our future, an ambitious vision we need. We can and must rewire, and education is the essential component. As many speakers have reminded us, this rewiring needs to start today, here and now. We no longer have the luxury of time, honestly. We need to urgently build education systems that help us live better with each other, with technology, and with life-sustaining ecosystems for our complex planet. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to invite the chair of the International Commission on the Futures of Education, Her Excellency Saleh Work Zeude, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, to present the report. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my great pleasure as Chair of the International Commission on the Futures of Education to present Reimagining Our Futures Together a new social contract for education at this important international education summit. All of us gathered here have a key role to play in advancing together our common vision for educational renewal and transformation, an education that can contribute to more inclusive, just, and sustainable futures for all. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a crossroads, a turning point in human history. While there has been undeniable progress over the past decades, unsustainable patterns of development and overlapping crises are threatening our shared values, our shared futures. The global disruption caused by COVID-19 pandemic has starkly reminded us of our vulnerabilities as well as of our interconnectedness. It has underlined the need for a fundamental shift in our development approaches. In our quest for growth, we have overwhelmed our natural environment, threatening our own existence. Today, high living standards coexist with persistent inequalities and exclusion. More and more people are engaged in public life, but the fabric of civil society and democracy is fraying. Technological innovation is transforming some of our lives, but also raising serious concerns for equity, inclusion, and democratic participation in many parts of the world, especially in the Global South and in Africa, where there exists a gap in digital divide. The futures of humanity and the planet are at risk. We now face a critical choice. Do we continue? on an unsustainable path or radically change course. Changing course begins by reframing what it means to be human, redefining our relationships with each other, with the living planet, as well as with technology. And education is key to redefining these relationships and can set us on path 
towards more just and sustainable futures for all. However, economically vulnerable and historically marginalized communities continue to be excluded from a promising future. Too many children, youth and adults are denied meaningful educational opportunities, especially women and girls, particularly in the global south. All emerging evidence indicates that the COVID-19 pandemic is dramatically worsening educational exclusion. Remote learning has had limited utility, even in homes with computers and internet, let alone in those households where such devices are not within the realm of possibility. The way we currently organize education does not ensure just societies and shared progress that benefits all. It's also not securing a peaceful humanity and a healthy planet. Education is caught between unfulfilled promises of the past and uncertain futures. To address this dual challenge and to shape just and sustainable futures, education itself must be transformed. First, education must be transformed to redefine our relationships with each other. In recent years, We've seen widening inequalities, democratic backsliding, and growing polarization. At the same time, citizen participation and activism have flourished worldwide in response to rising discrimination and injustice. We need pedagogies of cooperation, collaboration, and solidarity that celebrate and sustain diversity and pluralism. We must also unlearn bias prejudice and divisiveness that plague all our societies. The spread of misinformation must be countered through scientific, digital, and humanistic literacies. Second, education must be transformed to redefine our relationships with the planet. Our planet is in peril. While many regions of the global south have contributed the least to the climate crisis, there are prone to the greatest risks. Steps are being taken towards decarbonization and the greening of economies, but they are insufficient to address the crisis we're facing. Fortunately, children and youth are leading the way, calling for meaningful action and delivering harsh rebacks to those who refuse to face the urgency of the situation. The ecological crisis requires curricula that fundamentally reorient the place of humans in the world. Environmental education will need to be a core component of education in the future. And finally, transforming education must help redefine our relationship with technology. Our relationship to information, data, and knowledge has changed profoundly over the past decades there is tremendous transformative potential in digital technologies. But the digital transformation of education needs to be steered to benefit all. We must first address the digital divide in both its technical and human dimensions across the world by ensuring that access is not a privilege, but a right for the 82% of learners in sub-Saharan Africa which lack internet access. And while digital technologies will transform the work of schools and teachers, they cannot and should not replace them. The human dimension of education remains central. The best algorithm cannot replace the social and emotional skills of educators, their humanity, their empathy, and their care. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to transform education and redefine our relationship with each other, with the planet and with technology, we need to forge a new social contract for education. The starting point is a shared vision of the purposes of education as a public endeavor and a common good. We must reaffirm and expand the foundational principles of the right to education that is lifelong and that encompasses the right to information, culture, science, and connectivity. Forging a new social contract for education is a critical step towards reimagining our futures together. 
we must ask fundamental questions. What should we continue doing? What should we abandon? And what needs to be creatively reimagined? A new social contract for education is our chance to repair past injustices and transform the future by rebalancing our relationships with each other, with the planet, and with technology. The report outlines a vision and steps to co-create this new social contract for education. It's not a blueprint, but an invitation to continued engagement. It calls for ongoing dialogue, research, and action to be taken toward government, civil society, educators, students, and youth. A new social contract for education must be built together in the spirit of the United Nations Secretary General's report on our common agenda. Reimagining our futures together will require a movement and many individual and collective acts of courage, leadership, creativity, and care that can ensure more just, inclusive, and sustainable futures for all. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam President, for this overview of why we need to transform education and also for the proposals of how to forge. We now move uh, to the next section, the next segment of this session, uh, a conversation about uh, the report. Uh, and I would like to welcome uh, our two guests, Mahai Yaya and uh, Jida King, to the stage, please. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, I'm very pleased that you could join us today uh, about this critical topic at Rewired, where everything is very much about the future, actually. And uh, let's start to uh, let me introduce briefly our two guests. Maha Yaya, you are a member of the commission who is responsible of working, thinking together, collecting ideas, and drafting this report. And actually, you are director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, leading research on important and very timely issues. Uh, uh, I mean, citizenship, uh, pluralism, social justice. So I'm sure you have very much to, to tell us about this perspective. Among the many uh, books, articles uh, you you, you written through your long career. Let me mention uh, a very recent one, Honor Voices. It's about the Syrian refugees uh, and their perspective. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, you can tell us more on that. Thank you. Thank you, Maher, Ma for Thank joining you. us today. Well, Gide, how are you? Very fine. Thank fine. you. Thank you for being here. Well, you are a, a youth, no doubt. You are a youth educator and a leader, right? And uh, I know you're currently curriculum, curriculum developer and designer, and you are very much engaged with WAVE, which is the acronym for the West Africa Vocational Education Organization. We are very much working on the ground, especially in Nigeria, right? Yes. With um, young people uh, in order to build their work-ready skills and enter the labor market through technology, not exclusively working on that. So very, very much on the topic as well. Thank you for being with us today and coming to Rewired. Well, we already discussed very much uh, in my brief introduction and the president work uh, presented uh, the, 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 the spirit, the vision of the report. So let me go straight to the point uh, about one of the main questions I have for both of you. And maybe, Maha, you can start, if you don't mind. You know, the, the report considers the future of education by looking uh, to 2050. Just I had a nice video in the opening session here, uh, starting from the perspective of 2070, right? So it's very much beyond the 2030 agenda. It's very much about uh, concern and hope about the long-term future. What will look different about education in 2050, in your vision? Please. 
Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be part of this launch. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in Dubai and at this Expo 2020, which is very much about the future. Um, just to let me begin by giving a broader context for this report. Um, it's coming out against the backdrop of, uh, in the last few decades, of a kind of a significant backsliding in democratic governance, uh, a, a rise in populist identity-based exclusionary politics and policies. Um, such sentiment has been really thriving on the discontent of those left behind by globalization or a globalized world order that saw walls come down but also an unprecedented movement of people across borders and spaces. Um, but this is also happening against the backdrop of um, technological advances and disruptions, as well as dramatic transformations in our climate. Um, all of these trajectories will have an impact on us for decades, and this impact could be either positive or negative. And I think for us, this is where we saw the central role of education. Because they not only, these trajectories, the unpredictability of many of these trajectories and the potential impact, will not only have an impact on or will, will affect uh, our education, but educational curricula, what we teach, how we teach, where we teach uh, our children, will also have an impact on these trajectories. It can influence them either positively or negatively. Um, so in that sense, the report itself is an invitation to all of us, to everyone uh, sitting here and far beyond, to actually think together, work together on what is the future that we want, and then what role can education play in making sure we get to that future, which is a much more hopefully positive and brighter one than the current trajectories we, we, we're on. And this is where we conceive of education in the report, as the President outlined, <clears throat> As, as, as something that happens in, across time and across space. It's not something that happens only in schools and the kind of circumscribed environment of schools or uh, classes, classrooms, but it's something that happens across multiple times, multiple spaces, and across generations. It's not limited to only period when one is in school. Um, so in that sense, in education is no more about building skills um, yes, skills are incredibly important. However, it's also about, um, you know, it's, it's skills for the labor market are incredibly important, but it's also about how to be better human beings. Um, to do so, we need to reorient education um, to the, the educational pillars, basically, to focus more on issues of human rights and values of ecological, intercultural, and interdisciplinary learning, and to also build, help children build a critical and analytical mind and social skills that allow them to not only fulfill their potential as human beings, but also to take responsibility for a rapidly changing world and look at ways they can also affect it positively. Um, so, in this context, curricula needs to be interdisciplinary, and we can maybe talk a little bit more about what that curricula could look like. Um, but essentially, it needs to equip children with the capacity to both analyze, to work together, to cooperate, to partner, but to also to critically think and assess and innovate solutions as we move forward. This is not a pipe dream. This is something we can achieve, and we can achieve together. Um, just look at the spread of misinformation. Children today do not have the tools, even adults, I think, I would venture to say, don't have the tools to be able to, to distinguish between what is uh, false and what is, what is true. The, the spread of false information and negative truths. Let me just give one uh, small example. In this past year, or two years actually, we've all kind of shrunk back into our small social bubbles uh, and a kind of a virtual existence. Uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And yet we continue to struggle, despite the, you know, they found vaccines, they've now, they're looking at preventive pills. Yet despite the advances, we're still struggling with different variants. We're also struggling with a lot of misinformation about how to deal with this pandemic. Without the critical tools that education can provide, we would not be 
where we are, I think, today. One additional point, and my last point on this issue, is that um, also we're not cooperating in the way we should be cooperating. Just to take one, one figure, only 3%, I believe, um, uh, is a, uh, only, let me just check the number, yep. Only 3% of those in low-income countries are vaccinated today, as opposed to 60% in the rest of the world. Hmm. This in and of itself should tell us um, I mean, should, should, should tell us the extent to which we are not dealing with this as a global issue that needs cooperation, coordination, and a shared sense of responsibility for each other. Had the vaccines be more equally spread, many are arguing today, we would not be dealing with the new mutations and the new variants that are emerging. I will stop right here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Maha. Very good points. Uh, good music to my ears. Uh, listening about curriculum value-based and, uh, and the dramatic change we need. Well, Gide, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you have a little different perspective? Please. Thank yeah, thank you very much for this um, um, point you made, Maya, about what can change and what is possible with education. Um, I think from my, in my perspective, in my opinion, um, the future of education or the futures of education is more than just the school. I think like Maya was talking about, Maya was saying, she talked about the society and um, the families and all of all this, all the components coming together to add to, to, add to what um, people are learning and how we are learning. Um, just to also say that what, what I, when I think about the futures of education or what education can become or what it is possible, I feel like education is a tool to help people become better, a tool to help us create better societies, a tool to help us make better decisions. And so as we go into the next um, decades, 20, 30 years from now, we should be thinking about how do we teach people how to think, how to challenge the status quo, how to change the future that they want or create the future that they want, how do they uh, make opportunities or create opportunities for themselves to get better at all the things that they do. Where, um, in my organization, we always talk about what is your long-term plan and what is your short-term plan and what are the little steps that you are taking to get there. You might not have a clear path to where you're trying to go to right now, but when you look at all that is available to you, the resources in your environment, you begin to ask yourself questions around what am I capable of doing? What are the things that are limiting me? And so education should be about empowering people with the right amount of skills, with the right amount of technical know-how that allows them to take their own future into their hands and create a part that gets them there. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I was going to talk about is, if we talk about the things that should change in education, we should also be talking about how do we um, like Maya was talking about, how do we um, differentiate between false news and, and accurate news? But also beyond that, we should also begin to teach people about how do we make um, better decisions with ourselves? Mm. How do we learn about life skills, skills that are able to take us from any walk of life to any walk of life, skills that are not limiting or not restrictive in their application, skills that take us in the classroom, skills that are useful on the, in the work, world of work, skills that are useful in our communication with our friends, skills that are not just limited to getting jobs and staying on jobs, but also beyond that opportunity that comes with jobs. Thank, Thank you, Julia. You. you bring me to a follow short question, short answer, please, so we can move quickly to next topics. Um, with, what kind of knowledge will be more important in the, in the 2020, 2050, right? Hmm. Just to, as a young person. As a young person, what kind of knowledge would be most important? Um, if I were to say, I would say that what the most important skill to learn as a young person is the ability to continue to learn. When I was looking at some of the submissions of the report, I talked about the fact that learning is lifelong and does not stop at any point in time. And I think that as a young person, today, tomorrow, next year, 20 years from now, the most important thing that somebody should be focusing on is how do I continue to be able to access education or access educational tools or access knowledge or access skills such that I don't get to any point and I'm unable to access these things or I don't get to a particular point and I don't have access to the tools that helps me to become a better person. So in the future, as we go into this future, what becomes very important for any young person is the, the access 
to these opportunities and to these tools that make us become better and make better decisions. As so it's there. about learning to learn. Yeah, exactly. Somehow. Exactly. And Thank I have a quick follow-up question, if I may, to you, Maha. Um, will the school still be the central locus to learn in I the future? I think they will continue to play in a very important role. Um, the shape of schools will change, I believe, uh, and it needs to change. Let's remember that the way the schools, the school as we know it today is a product of the 19th century. We're now in the 21st century. So we need to think about even the spaces in which learning takes place, uh, how they need to be redesigned to encourage, physically redesigned, to encourage more engagement, more cooperation, partnerships. Um, so I, I, I think, yes, schools will remain important, but they will not be the only place. Uh, and even the school as a space itself is going to change and needs to change. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure in the report uh, you'll give some uh, recommendations on that, but uh, let's absolutely. tease uh, uh, on that. Well, the, the ambitious message from this report, as uh, Madam President Saleh work Zeude said clearly, is to build a new social contract for education. And what, in your view, what needs to change in our current social contract for education? Which are the dimensions that we, we have to address first? Three things. Um, first is we need to look at education as a global common good, one that we all collectively take responsibility for. This is, goes far beyond the idea that the right to education is a fundamental human right. That's absolutely uh, true but we need to go even beyond that. It's a global public uh, common good that collectively we are all responsible for each other and to make sure that everyone has access and is able to learn, particularly issues of lifelong learning. The second issue is inclusive research across fields and borders, ones that encourage innovative solutions for global problems. Here we can also harness the power of the new AI and technology, uh, and build on the wisdom of the old. Um, that is centuri centuries of knowledge that many of us around the room and around the world hold. And perhaps actually being in Expo 2020 is a prime, prime example of that. If you go around some of the pavilions, you will see how the, the wisdom of the old is being harnessed through uh, the, the, the new technological innovations uh, and, and approaches. And then the third thing I would say, cooperation and partnerships in, at multiple levels, whether it's local communal, whether it's national, whether it's regional, and where it's, whether it's global. The kind of, the complexity that marks our world today um, and the interlinked challenge uh, or nature of the challenges that we face mean that what happens in one part of the world immediately has an impact elsewhere. The pandemic is just one, but there are many other issues um, that, that, that and I'll give, I'll give one example in a second. But basically, this means that we need to work together to be able to resolve these issues and these problems. We cannot resolve them either as individuals, as, as, as communities, as nations, uh, on, on, on our own. Um, climate change is just one challenge. I'll give another, which is the plight of refugees and internally displaced. Yeah. This is something that is very much part of this region. I mean, just again, another figure, the Middle East and North Africa region um, has 5% of the global population, yet has more than 50% of the global refugee and internally displaced population. Millions of these children are today, do not have access, are either out of school due to conflict, due to drought, due to economic situations, um, and they do not ha have access to any sort of formal education. This is not an issue that one organization or one nation can build. Mm -hmm. We need a global compact and cooperation and coordination and innovative solutions to be able to address this issue as a problem uh, at, at this massive scale. Ultimately, this also means rethinking the way we bo both how we govern, but also how we are governed. Um, and I think this is also part of how we rethink this global new social contract on education. I'll stop here and we can... Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a new social contract, of course, uh, must have 
young people on board, I suppose. Ab and uh, how do you see the role of young people in building this new ambitious social contract for education? Uh, I think for me, I'll talk about it from the young person and also maybe a little bit about also the, the teachers, the individuals who are involved in this teaching. Um, so I'll start by talking about the teachers. I think that the first things first, we need to have, the teachers need to have an opportunity to be empowered enough to do all that is within their power and go beyond to ensure that the system, the knowledge is being passed on right. Because um, it's beyond having the right curricula, it's beyond having the right um, um, systems, but also the teachers need to be able to, need to have the abilities and the powers involved to pass it on. So first and foremost, let's empower the teachers to be able to do the right. Secondly, let's design curriculum that allows for people to go from school either into employment or into entrepreneurship. Because if, if the curriculum is only focusing on school and school and school, like Maha said, this educational system was designed in the 70s. Right now we're in the 21st century and a lot of people want to go into education but not come out and go into white collar employment. They want to come out and either become an entrepreneur, become um, a, um, social media manager and all of all the other various jobs that are coming out now. And so let's redesign the curriculum so that it allows for these individuals to go from point A to wherever the future they're determining for themselves are. Um, lastly, we also have to involve the employers of labor because we cannot design curriculum in isolation. We are designing curriculum to teach people, and these people are going to come out of the schools and go and work somewhere. So how do we design something that is effective for those people are going to go and work with if those people are going to work with are not involved? So we have to involve the employers of labor. We have to involve um, stakeholders in society, government, and also and all of those um, political policy makers. So that at the end of the day, we are designing curriculum that is beneficial to the young person, but also allows the young person to move from just knowing and then going to on to implement that knowledge in every aspect of the work that they're going to do outside of school. Sounds really like a, an old society approach. Exactly. Right? In order to rebuild, and it makes sense. I mean, yes. we have uh, a few few minutes uh, to a very last question I, I wish to, 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 to put on the table and to, to briefly discuss with you. The role of technology, I mean, Rewire is a, a very good example of how we can leverage technology to make better <laughs> our conversation globally. Yeah, people, very, very many people, thanks. Uh, to, to, to the organizer uh, convening here in Dubai, but very many other, you know, listening to us uh, st live streaming and so. So, how do you ensure that technology will be part of the equation without leaving the human dimension behind? Just to put it simply, what do you think about? I think it's, uh, I mean, it, technology already is part of our solution. Uh, we saw this with COVID, the issue of distant learning, but it also highlighted the fundamental inequity that marks our world. So it, making sure that technology is part and parcel, but it also actually, the whole COVID experience also highlighted the extent to which the human dimension remains fundamentally important. I don't believe it's one or the other. It has to be a combination of the two. Um, children, as many of us saw during this period, when isolated, they actually don't learn. They don't learn the way they need to be learning because the engagement and interaction with others, as adults, we don't learn the way we need to be learning, um, even when, you, when we're isolated. We're, we're human beings, we're social beings. So the, the idea of being in school, engaging with other, uh, you know, with, with friends, with colleagues, with other kids their age, but also with teachers who hold their hand, uh, uh, show them what they need to do, allow them, help them to cooperate, to coordinate, to partner. It's, I think, both at the same time. Again, we can harness technology, we can use technology in order to advance critical skills, but it should not be an either or kind of uh, equation for, for, for us. Thank you. Well, Judy, I see you are the only one of the three of us coming with paper and pen, and you are the youngest one. So, <laughs> is it a kind of a hidden message? Which is your position about the role of technology to leverage, to, to, you know, to boost the future of education? Please tell us uh, quickly. 
Because okay, you have to very briefly. I, 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 re I recognize that technology is an enabler of everything, and it also creates for us the opportunity to expand and do more and all of all those things. But then, I, like Ma, Ma has mentioned, it cannot be either or. It has to be a combination of both. Um, so in as much as I believe and I strongly believe that technology is the way to go, when we design curriculum, in my, where, when, when I design curriculum, I'm only talking about what is the human element of it? Because if you are designing any training curriculum or any educational material with the sole purpose of just technology being the um, backbone of that, then you lose out on an integral element that I was mentioning about the human interaction. And so for us, it's always about how do we build curriculum that is enabled and able to be used via technology, but also what is the human element of it and how are we able to ensure that as these individuals learn, the interaction that needs to take place, the group works, the activities, the peer-to-peer um, -peer mentorship, all of all these various elements continue to exist. It is not about um, using technology to go far, but it's also how do we go far together? How do you encourage group learning? How do you encourage group interaction with technology as an enabler of all of all these things? So it's, yes, great, important, beautiful, but we cannot remove the human element. We cannot remove the need for interaction, the interconnectivity that human beings look like, and all of all these elements are very important in the, in, in, in the designing of this new social construct. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can conclude here. Very encouraging message, I think, and inspiring with this part of the session. And uh, I move to the real conclusion of this session. Thank you, Maha, and thank you, Jide. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to turn uh, to another member of the International Commission responsible for drafting this important report. Uh, Professor Arjun Appadurai, I'm sure you know him, is joining remotely. I wish to see if he's connected. Arjun? Yes, I am. Great. Great to, to, to listen to you and see you now. Thank you. Well, Arjun, like Maha, has been a member of the International Commission and is a professor in media, culture, and communication at NYU, New York University. And is the author of very many interesting, inspiring books uh, and essays, including, let me mention this very recent one, The Future as a Culture Fact. We are talking about the future, uh, Professor Appadurai, and uh, I really would like to, to give you the floor in order to, to share with you your vision and your experience within the commission. Thank you. The floor is yours. <clears throat> well, thanks very much uh, to you, uh, ADG Stefania Giannini, and also to President Werke for, uh, along with your, our other colleagues and team members, uh, giving me this chance uh, to say a few words. Uh, I have to say that uh, I am so inspired and moved by everything that has been said by all of you that it's very difficult to know what I can add, which is at all uh, useful. But the lucky thing about having prepared remarks is that you have to give them anyway, whether they are helpful or not. So here they come. So. It is a great honor to add my perspective as one of the people who were privileged to contribute to this outstanding report. I'm certain that it will, it will be a useful tool for many teachers, researchers, students, and parents as they try to tailor their own local solutions to the planetary challenges we face. I believe that the values, insights, and concrete suggestions that have been uh, assembled in this document, in this report, can be a valuable resource in a time when the world has become saturated by uncertainty. We are in the grip of radical uncertainty about the coronavirus, 
And the avalanche of numbers, uh, graphs, scenarios, and predictions, even for the most judicious experts, has proved inadequate. Likewise, efforts to manage and redirect migration policy are regularly confounded by new movements of migrants and produce new levels of uncertainty. The global financial markets produce even more uncertainty even as they find new ways to profit from it. Democracy itself seems to rest on uncertain grounds, as autocrats in many countries rewrite constitutions, hijack elections, and manipulate the media. Historically, even the most enlightened efforts to bring justice, reason, and freedom to the world have been behind the curve. They arrive on the scene after the damage is done to repair wounds, restore normalcy, and revise policies. We need to use education to get abreast of the curve of uncertainty rather than to pick up the pieces after the damage is done. In this spirit, UNESCO and its many constituencies can help education to become transformative and not just restorative or corrective. Today's transformations are often traumatic, exploitative, or elitist. They produce uncertainty, but they do not equip us to design our own transformations of society, culture, or the environment. Education can and should help us design our own transformations rather than to simply react to transformations that are imposed upon us. Science has always thrived on uncertainty, and so can we. There are ways to get ahead of the curve of uncertainty. One is to better balance the goal of transmitted transmitting acquired knowledge and the goal of creating new knowledge. We can only do this by enabling all citizens, especially those who are racially, economically, or politically marginalized, to build their own designs for transformation, to be curious in their own settings, and to find ways to imagine the future without requiring expensive and esoteric degrees and credentials. We can shift, we can also shift the center of educational gravity from a small circle of experts, managers, and consultants to a wider body of activists, community organizers, and advocacy groups so that our curricula from kindergarten to advanced graduate education reflect the urgent dilemmas of multiple locations rather than the abstract norms of a small group, of a small expert community. Finally, we can teach students of all ages that uncertainty is a fundamental feature of our lives and that we need to make it the wind behind our sails rather than the storm we wish to avoid. In short, to make education the midwife of multiple futures, we may need to embrace uncertainty rather than to suppress or to avoid it. This change, of course, will require us to change many of our inherited ways of thinking about knowledge, creativity, and conjecture. As we look forward to the message of the common agenda articulated by UN Secretary General Guterres and to the planned UN Summit on Education in 2022, the report on the futures of education will be a welcome tool for drawing in a wide constituency to help make uncertainty an ally rather than an opponent in our struggles to democratize the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Apaudurai.
also for high highlighting the importance of education to be transformative and transform to the, the end. And now I'm giving the floor for the real, real last word to Madam President once again for her conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will see this as a report full of hope, which is the intention of our Commission on the Futures of Education. We seek to be a catalyst for a reimagined future of justice and equality achieved through paradigm of education. Today, our access to knowledge and to tools that enable us to collaborate is unprecedented in human history. The potential for engaging humanity in creating better futures together has never been greater. But this will require strengthened cooperation and solidarity. Historical exclusions must be redressed. It's only through individual and collective actions grounded in the wealth of our cultural diversity that the futures we want can be shaped. At its 1995 general conference, UNESCO introduced the concept of a culture of peace. A quarter century later, my clarion call today for the world is for us to embody the culture of peace, since peace is a prerequisite for securing human development. In order, in order to improve education uh, in each of our countries, peace is a fundamental building block. And I'm well placed to say it. Our work is far from done. It's just beginning. I call on each and every one of you to join me on our path to securing a better, more just, and more peaceful world through education. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much to Madam uh, President Saleh Work Zeude. Thank you for our inspiring speakers today, Maha Yaya. G. De King, Arjun Appadurai, and for those in the audience, I hope you can have a look to this uh, inspiring new report. And uh, UNESCO, you'll, you'll find interesting uh, inspirations, I'm sure, and UNESCO is keen to work with you to make the report in action. Thank you so much.